sweat of setting up this wonderful uh, school and uh, workshop on quantum science and technologies. And unsurprisingly, this is what this talk will be about. Yet, in a very specific flavor, this will not be a review talk, but there will be one particular question in the focus of all this, yet one that seems pretty much at the heart of the matter, which is how can we hope quantum devices to eventually provide some speed up over classical computers? So what's at stake here is how we can hope quantum devices to, in one way or the other, computationally outperform classical supercomputers. So this picture here we've seen maybe rather too many than too few times, potentially, but what is undeniably true is that at some point the field needs to deliver a strong evidence that quantum machines can do something we cannot do otherwise in computational uh, means. So that's surely undoubtedly be true for the anticipated device of a universal quantum computer which could solve uh, some NP problems in polynomial time. So you could even check the correctness of the computation at the end of the day, but then it's great and there's been all this progress in recent years and months of realizing universal quantum computers. Alas, we do not quite have them yet. What we do have, in contrast, are quantum devices, are analog simulator systems that do something that, that mimic other quantum systems, that probe interesting physics, that maybe just simulate themselves, but some system where a very large degree of control can be reached and with a kind of top-down approach, uh, one can uh, have control of a very large number of degrees of freedom. These systems do exist. So what ultimately is their computational power? What are they doing? Um, and this seems much less clear, in fact, although this seems a crucial question. So analog quantum simulators, so they are not BQP complete. They're not fully fledged quantum computers. Uh, but what's their precise computational power after all? Then error correction, or let alone fault tolerance, seems to be out of scope. I mean, that's uh, kind of out of the, the ballpark here. But is this a bug or a feature? I mean, do errors necessarily accumulate and make everything like noisy and, 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 and wobbly, or is there some hope to these, these guys to be stable in one way or, or, or the other? And that seems to be, I mean, while I'm not promising to present any kind of uh, fully fledged answer to these questions, I do think they are crucial if you want to make the point that realistic devices that we may have now, or may have in the near future, can promise a speed up over classical machines in one way or the other. I'm also not saying that quantum simulation is all about the speed ups of that type, but if that is not available, then the entire field will be challenged to say the least. So let's assume that we have a good day and anticipating that quantum simulators should be able to solve problems inaccessible to quantum computers, we go into some lab and perform a simulation where we have good evidence that we could not have done otherwise. Right? We, we have this sophisticated cold atoms experiment, we do a computation and the outcome, or a simulation, and the outcome is five. And then we say, great, is this correct? Well, how do you know? It's a hard problem, right? I mean, these are not NP problems. There's not a, a witness that would easily check the correctness of the outcome. So how would we know we've done the right thing in an analog simulation? And that shows part of the irony of this question, and the whole talk is a bit of a high-level joke in the sense, in that the superior computational power of quantum simulators on the one hand, and the certification of the correctness of a simulation in the absence of being an NP problem on the other, this seems to be a highly intricate and, and somewhat ironic fashion. And this, a question, this will be the guiding question for the rest of this talk. Again, no fully fledged answers, but we should definitely ask these kind of questions. Good. Okay, that sets the stage. So, analog quantum simulators. Um, well, the presumably most advanced simulators of that kind are so-called systems based on cold atoms in optical lattices. Um, 
they are kind of artificial condensed matter lattice systems that are formed by counter-propagating laser light, where the atoms sit in the, in the potential minima of this, um, of this artificial lattice. It's an interesting topic in its own right to talk about the implications in that type of architectures, and we might hear more about that even in the subsequent talk, if I'm right. Yet for the present purposes of this talk, because we want to keep on focus, um, it's maybe good enough to say that such systems allow to probe local Hamiltonian problems to remarkable accuracy for l a large number of particles. So in this context, I'd like to cite Ian Wormsley, who once got a question from the audience when giving, presenting some optical protocol, and then some smartass asked, oh, but can you do this as an asymptotic protocol? And Ian, with his nice Oxford accent, said, yeah, look, I'm an experimentalist. We are not asymptotic people. Having said that, this is pretty much asymptotic. So the, like 10 to the power 4 and 5 particles are well approachable in, 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 in this setting. One can look at ground state properties of phases, then qu quenches, like you quench a system out of equilibrium and look at the evolution in time, slow evolutions, like kibble zurich type settings, uh, driven systems like Floquet type driven systems, these are all accessible with that type of architecture under extraordinarily precise conditions and in a coherent fashion for 10,000 or even 100,000 of, of particles. Um, so a plot that I like to show in this context is this one here that relates to the equilibration thermalization in, in quantum many-body systems. So in this experiment, this quantum simulation, uh, what has been prepared was a, an initial state of 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, so a charge density wave initial state, if you want. And then this state was suddenly and quickly quenched to a full translation environment, bose hubbard many body Hamiltonian, and then the evolution was monitored in time as a function of time. So this is how it looks like if you look at the even particles per site as a function of time. And there's some, I mean, initially there's no particles whatsoever in the odd sites, and then there's some non-equilibrium dynamics until for long times one gets obviously half a particle uh, per site. Um, so there's a lot to say about this, not today. For the present purposes, it's only interesting maybe to emphasize that um, this picture not only shows the quantum simulation under very precisely controlled conditions in Emanuel Bloch's lab in, 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 in Garching uh, as a function of time, but also in blue, the re-simulation on a classical computer on the same, under the same conditions. That's not a, a fit, but it's a re-simulation the, under the same conditions, and it's not only a re-simulation, but it used the best algorithm available for that type of problem at that time, like a matrix product state based algorithm, then it, um, it, it uh, runs on the, on the fastest computer the German taxpayer could afford in the Ulich Supercomputing Center, and it costs like about five weeks of runtime per plot for 6,000 by 6,000 MPS bond dimension in the, in the, in the MPS. So that's, really, that's pretty much the upper limit of a publishable result on, on the merits, it seems fair to say. You have five weeks, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, so this is nice, because these algorithms have very strong predictive power. Not only can you say something, but for what they can say, in principle, one could even give error bars, putting together trotter errors and the MPS approximation error. Yet, they only work for short times. For longer and longer times, there will be a blow-up of the entanglement entropy, and there's no way one can faithfully represent the state anymore as an MPS, so there's a barrier. No algorithm of that type, type can go further. But that creates a very interesting situation in that the quantum simulation runs on. Why would it care what we can do classically on our computer? Right? So you can ask questions better based on the data than on the classical simulation that's only used to build trust in the correctness of the quantum simulation. Right? It's a baby step, but it's a, it's a step in this direction that there is scope to, 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 to um, outperform this. So to cut a long story short, short times can be efficiently approximated uh, here, while long times cannot, um, cannot be. Then, in a similar mindset, we looked at dynamical phase transitions or 
dynamical settings beyond the Kibble Zurich setting where one dimensional settings could be completely re-simulated in all glory and detail and, and all error bars and so on. But 2D not, yet the experiment in 2D is a very small modification of the 1D experiment, just changing the confinement. So again, having a realm of classical simulatability and not in other settings. Or in the many body localization context, a question I'm much interested in these days, again, 1D systems can be simulated 2D non. So this is sometimes underappreciated, but it's important to stress that even with present technology, there are quantum simulators that outperform state-of-the-art simulations on classical supercomputers running the best algorithms to date, which is a very promising and, and, and good insight in, 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 in that. So in this sense, we are already there in that there's evidence that our present technology machines can at least solve problems, and these are problems addressing questions interesting in theoretical physics like equilibration times and so on that cannot be kept track of on classical supercomputers. Having said that, um, and, and I'm actually ha happy to provide feedback. This talk, I, I keep it rather good in time to have some space for threats and discussions at the end. Good, good. Anyway, um, one can play devil's advocate. You say, good, that's a nice baby step. Um, but there could be clever simulation methods. Who are we to think that we cannot simulate that system? And like, I get what, one email per month or so of people who re-simulate that plot that I showed earlier, that kind of provoke people to try that. And that's a very interesting endeavor. However, there's a couple of fallacies one can fall into. Like one is, it's, um, it's not a fit. I mean, no, it's, uh, the first thing is it's about functional dependence. It's not like providing one plot, but you have to have the knobs of the initial preparations and reconstruct the functional dependence of this family of plots given that parameter that you can feed in. It's a much heavier problem. Second, it's about predictive power. It's not that in retrospect you look at the plot and say, oh, this must have been this. It's about being able to predict this with this error bar. So even if like some uncontrolled approximation may give rise to a similar picture, that doesn't mean that you could have predicted it with the same level of accuracy. So there's a couple of fallacies that one could fall into. Having said that, there's no proof whatsoever that you cannot simulate these things ultimately on classical supercomputers. So to be safe against that, you want to have a, 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 an argument, a proof based on notions of computational complexity. In the same way as we say quantum computers are more powerful, by which we mean there's a computational complexity claim that they can solve BKP problems outside BPP. So to be sure, we want to prove the hardness of the task and identify a feasible task, some intermediate problem that lies outside of BPP. Sounds like a communist party, but it's a complexity class. It's like the, the, the classical probabilistic algorithms, but it's not PQP hard, so cannot solve an arbitrary quantum algorithm because these are just not quantum computers. So that is at stake, find a feasible scheme that you can realize in the lab, yet does something hard and interesting, not accessible otherwise. I mean, we have to deliver this at some point. Okay, so super polynomial computational speed ups. One, candidate of this type is this famous boson sampling. It's, um, it's, the, it's, it's set up to find some problem with strong evidence for supercomputational speed up that's sometimes dubbed quantum computational supremacy. It's not the nicest of all words, but it says what it says. It's like some evidence for a speed up. This boson sampling problem is a very simple problem of this type. It's a beautiful set setup where you take M bosons in M optical modes, uh, N photons in M modes, you put them in a linear optical multiport, and at the end of the day, you make a photon detection detecting the number of photons. Let's do the experiment. 1, oh, oh, 1, oh, good. Good. So let's do it again. 1, 1, oh, 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 whatever. It's a quantum golden board. It's a random thing. It's like a very expensive num random number generator. Having said that, it's a very interesting random number generator because it's quite uniform, but not quite. There is intricate tails in this distribution, 
And it's so intricate that you cannot sample from this distribution on a classical computer, as has been shown under reasonable assumptions. Right? This is, um, so this can be realized as a linear optical multiport, as we've already seen in other talks um, this, this week. Um, so this is the claim that you cannot sample from a distribution closed in L1 norm if the scaling of the number of photons and modes is right and the unitary is cho chosen in a hard random fashion. That's very exciting because that's an experiment that's relatively easy to do. It doesn't solve the most practical of all tasks, but it solves a problem that's inaccessible to classical computers. And that's, of course, a very exciting um, pr premise, and that motivated leading experimentalists to provide a number of beautiful experiments of proof of principle type of this kind based on either integrated optical circuits or bulk optics kind of realizing small instances of such a machine, and that's surely a, a very important way, way forward. Now, is this functioning? Well, I can ask, if, look at the state preparation and ask, can you verify the correctness of this, of this state that is being prepared? Maybe I, I, I cut this short for reasons of, of, of time. I'm just saying we spend a lot of time on finding tools to verify the correctness of states based on measurements that's not achieving tomographic knowledge, but just ask, has the right state been prepared? And here I say this is good for Gaussian states, for low photon number states. It's not quite possible to verify the correctness of this state. But there's a stronger state, but that's more ironic, that's true at the same time, which is this one. Take the boson sampler and remove the boson sampler. Right? What I mean is, don't read this thing, it looks technical. The thing is, if you have a boson sampling quantum device, there's a slightly longer classical circuit with the property that you cannot distinguish the output from one from the other with polynomially many samples. If we think what that means is, like, I claim I have a boson sampler, but I've just programmed my iPhone and you've no way of falsifying me having just programmed my iPhone. It's like, a bit polemically speaking, it's like I claim I have a supercar, and you look at it, it's like, it looks like a Volkswagen Polo. I said, no, 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 it's a supercar, and I can't even prove it. And then you drive it, 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 it accelerates like a Polo, it brakes like a Polo, it feels like a Polo, you, you look at it, it's like, whoa, it's like a Polo. And, well, no, but it operationally is indistinguishable from one. Right? I mean, this is not a contradiction, but it shows that there's an interesting twist and irony in this uh, super polynomial power and the verification of that in the absence of having an NAP problem. So it generates, it, 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 by no means I'm critical of that type of endeavor. In fact, I'm encouraging it, but it does show that there is an interesting kind of twist and even kind of um, like it's something to be clarified here. After all, that's not so, so surprising. I mean, one could say in order to be able to verify a quantum simulation, one needs to be able to efficiently simulate it. If you can do it, you can check. If you can't, how can you check? These are not NP problems. It's a very common de-stated setting. There is other examples of that type. IQP circuits have been um, discussed, random universal circuits, easy type interactions that are alternative ways of achieving such a promise with nice properties, some of them have a hardness proof under L1 errors in an additive fashion. That's not a detail. You want to be able to prove hardness under at least realistic additive errors because, I mean, no apparatus will ever be error free. So the absence of error correction, you have to have that property. Yet, these schemes are all extremely hard to implement, to say the least. They're hard to scale up with present technology either, or you need an arbitrary gate choice, which is fine, but then why not build a quantum computer? Or they're periodic, which is good, but they would be periodic with a periodicity, say, of 56 in the best known scheme previously. Like one unit cell has 56 qubits that you need to coherently manipulate, and then it's periodic. Then you say, good, but I mean, if the unit cell is 56 qubits, which is much larger than the best universal quantum computer we have to date, then that's a bit pushing it. I think that's a fair statement. So there is more work to be done. Which brings me to the last part of this talk already, um, which is, can we think of feasible quantum simulators providing a speed up? Yeah, where we 
want to find problems with some strong evidence for super polynomial speed up, but we want to combine both the best of both worlds and bring speed ups closer to experiment, but not having periodicities of 56 or intractable scalings and so on, but something that's more reasonable, more realistic to present experiments, or even close to ones that are already there, um, but still have that, that, that promise, that's, that speed up. And this is the point of the last bit of this talk. And then we can discuss. Good, so what we want is, or what I want, I mean this is, but this is not, a, not an unjustifiable desire, is we want to look at a Hamiltonian quench architecture. That is really reminiscent of the type of non-equilibrium quench quantum simulator settings that people are anyway interested in. I'm also interested, that I mentioned at the beginning on probing stuff. Then we want to have a low periodicity of the interaction Hamiltonian. So please not 56 or so, but one, maybe two, I mean nearest neighbor. That's what you have in labs, in, in nature. You don't have tuned 56 qubit interactions, and it's still local, but it's mathematically local. And you want to have hardness proofs with an L1 norm error bound under reasonable assumptions. And, um, and I'm presenting one of them. So there's a couple of architectures we've conceived. Uh, I will only look at one to leave time for discussions. Uh, which is based, which is this one here, which is, to my understanding, a very simple prescription. I mean, I have no imagination to make it simpler. It's this. Wow. Uh, but I'm free to get um, in, in, uh, insights into that. So what it is, it's on a square lattice. Think of a cold atomic architecture, say. Square lattice, and you have an initial state of all the spins, qubits, whatever you want to call them, in a product state, all product, no correlations or whatever, yet in a, in a mildly random fashion. There's some randomness involved, you either have a zero or some tilted state. Right? That's what it is. Um, you can think of this as being the ground state of a disordered optical lattice that has already been done in Emanuel's and Uli Schneider's labs. You can think of another thing, I just have a product initial state with some randomness. It's a highly reasonable initial state. Then one looks at the quench for a finite time under a, a plain vanilla easing Hamiltonian. So no long range, no 56, whatever, a nearest neighbor easing Hamiltonian, which is presumably the easiest Hamiltonian that nature has in store. I think this is a fair statement. So it's just a no, normal easing Hamiltonian, like classic or whatever you want, easing Hamiltonian involved it for a unit time. This is not only conceivable, but has been realized in the lab as was one of the first experiments done in optical lattices, which does, didn't really catch on so much, which surprises me. But this kind of cold collision experiment by these people when they were still together um, was one of the earliest interesting cold atomic experiments. So this is kind of, can be con considered done. And the last step is you just measure. But no adaption, no tuning, no whatever, you just measure it out. But all in the X bases, there's one sampling measurement of the X bases. And that's also not out of the way. Although that may be, that might be the technologically most challenging aspect. I mean, there has been lots of work on single side addressing in optical lattice experiments. That's a very interesting uh, technique in, in, in many settings. Yet one has to map the internal degree of freedom to a density, particle density, I suppose. So this might be some issue, but by no means is this out of the way, I would say. I mean, when I talk to Emmanuel, it says, fine. I mean, it's not super easy, but it's also not super difficult. And that's the scheme. Product initial state, unit time quench, and you measure. OK, that's the scheme. Now the argument is that this is solving a hard problem. So assuming three plausible complexity theoretic conjectures that I will mention, one cannot sample from that distribution on a classical computer, oh, but though you can do the sampling on the experiment. So this is um, the statement that this may be not the most practical of all problems, but it is producing a problem that you cannot sample classically. And the argument behind that is an argument that makes use of the fact that it's sharply hard to approximate the output distribution of this all x measurement to a constant relative vector. Um, 
I have some technical slides. I will maybe shrink them a little bit, but I'm perfectly happy to, to provide answers. I hint at the techniques involved because the setting is very simple. There's no adoption, no circuits, no gates, no nothing. But of course, the, the underlying argument is long and winding and goes through all kinds of quantum information techniques. So in particular, the setting is matched with a non-adaptive measurement-based quantum computing scheme, which is then mapped onto a certain type of random circuits involving Z, Control Z, Hadamard, and T gates. Um, that is kind of under the hood, so it is a random circuit under the, under the, un, un, under the game. So the, the universal computation in the post-selected fashion is crucial for this argument. And the entire mathematical hardship of this argument is to apply Stockmeyer's algorithm and to relate the hardness of approximating individual probabilities of, of certain outcomes to the hardness of approximating the sampling algorithms. And the, the whole thing uh, circles around a proof of contradiction that one would end up with an FBPP to the power of NP algorithm to solve Sharpie hard problems which would collapse, result in the collapse of the polynomial hierarchy on, 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 the third, on the third level. So this comes together with um, certain arguments that involve probability distributions and the anti-concentration of probability distribution, which I will say something about in, in, in a second. Maybe I highlight the assumptions going in here. I mean, all these arguments have some assumptions, but one should be aware that assumptions in computer science mean something less severe than in physics. In physics, we say the assumption is it's mean field, a very strong assumption. In computer science, I say that the polynomial hierarchy is infinite. That's an extremely weak assumption. It basically it's like says that P is not NP. Fine, it's an assumption, but I mean, if that's not true, then why are we here, right? Or, I mean, then why is there internet security and so on? Then it's an average case complexity argument that a finite fraction of these instances is hard to sample in worst case. Then in worst case, that's strictly speaking also an assumption, but let me remind you that this is the same assumption that you do when you rely on the security of your internet banking. Because this is something that people should be aware of, that factoring is an NP problem, of course, but um, by no means is it understood in what regime the hard clauses lie. It's not like in 3SAT where this is very well understood, like in LLL. So it's not so easy. So there's an average case complexity assumption when you make internet banking or HTTPS, WhatsApp. Yeah. So th this is a strictly speaking assumption. And an anti-concentration bound, which is a property of a distribution. Here it's, there's very strong numerical evidence, but in a mild variant of this, uh, problem. We have a rigorous proof of that, which is interesting method development in its own right to close the different loopholes in these type of arguments. So if interested, ask me about it. There is method work related to rigorous arguments on random circuits involved here. But this is the thing. But under all these assumptions, one can go into the lab, perform this experiment under reasonable technological assumptions using <laughs> techniques that are not only conceivable, but that are already available with present or past technology, and the quantum simulation is intractable on classical computers. So that was my, my main message. There's one add-on, which is fine. But how about the irony? I was, I was making all this point of the irony. Right? It's, so, it's supposed to be a high-level joke. So, I, I, again, I mean, how would we know that it's correct? It's not an NP problem, again. So the same burden, is, well, burden is a too strong word, I mean, this should not, not sound negative, but I mean, the same intertwinement could be there. But here now there's an interesting twist, which is one can, with order n many measurements, verify the correctness of the state prepared in, in L1 norm, and even the distribution in L1 norm, by making certain measurements that are very similar to the ones that you would make anyway. But this is not just building trust in the computation or just like an evidence of some kind. It is really bounding the right quantity, the L1 norm of the distribution, of the one distribution that you use in the argument. So it's extremely interesting that you, you can go into the lab, you can make measurements, and ultimately, oh, you could say that either the red light goes on and say, oh, we have to try harder, another research grant, we have to make a better measurement. Or the green light goes on, but if the green light goes on, it's not evidence that, or trust in that, or you have verified that this computation as such is doing the right thing, which is a nice feature to have. So you can verify the correctness of this. So there's this, oh, what is happening here? 
There's this, oh, what is, stop, 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 stop. I'll go back. Um, so this is prejudice that in order to be able to verify a quantum simulation, one needs to be able to simulate it efficiently. But this is not quite true. There are some settings, delicate settings, in which a trustworthy quantum simulator can be verified. It's not an NP problem. But you can verify the correctness even if the classical simulation is beyond reach. So what is coming out? I cannot predict. You have to go into the lab. You have to do the quantum simulation. But you can verify the correctness. It's one bit correct, and then you do the simulation. It's an, inter it's an interesting thing that being able to prove the correctness is something weaker than making the prediction. It's also ontologically an interesting observation, I find. You don't have to find it interesting. OK, now I'm really at the end of my talk. So the whole talk was a question, what sense it can be feasible to realize quantum devices that outperform classical machines that are not fully fledged quantum computers. That is something we have to deliver soon to give me to this field that we can do something interesting. Now, the positive note of this is there is hope that feasible quantum simulators can show a super polynomial speed up, solving some problem. It's not fault tolerant, but that's a feature of the bug. We don't want fault tolerance. I mean, of course, you want fault tolerance. But if it's not available, then we should find ways of, of getting around it. But it is error resilient in the sense of additive errors, and it's certifiable in the sense if the error levels are small enough, the green light goes on. Or the red light if it's too much noise, but it's error detecting if you want. So one can efficiently assess the correctness, even if the simulators exhibit computational supremacy, it's philosophically also interesting that you can verify something you cannot predict. It's saying I'm right in the following statement, but I cannot give an evidence for this. That's kind of an interesting, interesting twist. So this is all I had to say as an outlook. Um, so this is great. But to be fair, it's not the most interesting of all schemes from a physical perspective. So quantum computer simulation is about lots of things. It's also about probing interesting quantities. I mean, what we said is already a baby step. It's a disordered Hamiltonian quenched in a, in a many body sense. So that has already the right flavor of a proper quantum simulation. But we want to be more practical even, link it more to MBL, to actual non-equilibrium problems that are people are anyway interested. That's a, a, an important way forward to connect it more to physically important schemes. Then the robustness. How can we think of quantum simulators being intrinsically robust in one way or the other, that errors don't accumulate too much. And finally, read out, read out, read out. I mean, there has been more techniques for tomographic tools to improve readout techniques. That's something we are doing with Gerd Schmidtmeier on having new windows into that type of system. So quantum simulators, I mean, I have made the point like how closely intertwined the computation speed up is with verification scheme. So this is sometimes underappreciated. It's the, the lame duck in this game. But I think certification and verification is the heart of the matter if we want to progress, which is the perfect moment to stop my talk. And I thank you very much for your attention.